If you had the power, what laws would you change in your community, your school, or the country? It's very easy for kids to burn out when they're having four classes that are each like over an hour long. I think reevaluating, if, if necessary, to draw lines of different communities. There's a lot of people who I think uh, shouldn't be given a voice, but if you censor them, then it's like you're stepping on my right to be heard. It can be a slippery slope, I think. This is Clara, Rachel, and Ed. They're students who participate in the Inquiring Minds Institute in New York. But what do you think should change? We are currently accepting submissions for a student contest, There Ought to Be a Law. We want K-12 students across the country to make a one to two minute audio or video clip telling us what legislation or repeal of currently existing legislation would improve their community. The deadline is March 31st. You can read all about it at civics101podcast.org slash contest. Submit. Okay, on with the show. Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Did you did you ever get in trouble at school for anything? I there's exactly one incident. It's not worth. Just tell me what it was. I knew a girl had the wrong answer. It was like an out loud test, and I indicated to her that she had the wrong answer, and the teacher said Hannah McCarthy ruined the day for everybody. Oh my god! I think I was in second grade. I hacked into. Uh I knew how to use DOS, so I hacked in to find out the teacher passwords for the kids' grades. I can't believe you did that. Yeah. I felt terrible about it. Every episode we work on gives me another reason to fall in love with Supreme Court cases. And today it's that a relatively minor offense can rise through the court system to achieve the stature of landmark decision. And the story of this case starts in spring 1980. Empire Strikes Back is about to hit the theater. Destroyed the Death Star, but their story didn't end there. Queen is at the top of the charts with a crazy little thing called love. Former Governor Ronald Reagan is campaigning against Jimmy Carter using the fresh new slogan. Ronald Reagan for president. Let's make America great again. And in Piscataway, New Jersey, 14-year-old girl broke a school rule and started her journey to the highest court in the land. She broke a school rule and ended up in the Supreme Court. What was she doing? Oh, I'll tell you, Hannah. Smoking? Smoking? You're listening to Civics 101. I'm Nick Capodice. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And we are looking at another Supreme Court case dealing with our right to privacy. Today, the case that defines your Fourth Amendment protections as a student. New Jersey v. TLO, 1985. First, I have to ask about the name of this case. Who is TLO? TLO is the respondent in this case. She was a minor at the time, so the court just used her initials. Uh, she was a freshman at Piscataway High School in New Jersey. Uh, she was caught smoking in the girls' room. You remember Barnesville State? What is it, Barton? That song, Smoking in the Boys' Room. This is Tracy Macklin. He's a professor at Boston University School of Law. And when I called him, neither of us could remember the name of the band. It was Brownsville Station, by the way, later covered by Motley Crue. And the song I sure do know, Smoking in the Boys' Room. I bring this up because I have to point out that smoking was allowed at this school at the time, just not in the bathroom. What? This is important later. Um, But TLO and another girl smoked in the bathroom just the same. And they got caught. They were. They were caught by a teacher, and they were marched to the office of Assistant Vice Principal Choplick. And he asked her whether she had been smoking, and she denied it. And she said she didn't even smoke. Uh, And so at that point, he, he grabbed her purse, opened it up, and saw a package of cigarettes. All right, stop. This is the moment where I can see the Fourth Amendment getting involved. That's the amendment that protects us against unreasonable search and seizure. Did the assistant vice principal have the authority to search her purse? This is the crucial moment in the case, Anna, and everything rests on that question. Because it's not just about finding cigarettes. It's what he saw after he opened the purse and took the cigarettes out. Uh, He found some rolling papers, uh, a note that talked about people that owed money to TLO, uh, and then a small amount of marijuana. You left out one item in the pocketbook of 40 bucks. I beg your pardon? You left out one item in the pocketbook. Yes. Which was $40 in $1 bills, 
which signified that she was selling it. Yes, Your Honor. That was Justice Thurgood Marshall, by the way, questioning the advocate for New Jersey in the case. That combination of rolling papers, marijuana, a book of names of people who owed TLO money, and a bunch of small bills was together enough evidence to get her sent to the police station with her mother, where she confessed. Yes, she had been selling marijuana in school, and she was sentenced by the court to a year of probation. What's interesting about this case is that it first comes up uh, with a question that is ultimately not decided in the decision. This is Sarah Sayo. She teaches at Columbia Law School. The school admitted that the Fourth Amendment was violated. And the question was, does the exclusionary rule apply? It starts as an exclusionary rule case. Yeah, we talked about the exclusionary rule in our Map v. Ohio episode, but Professor Sayo gave us a quick recap. And the exclusionary rule is if the state official violates a constitutional right to get that evidence, then that evidence must be excluded or cannot be used against the individual in a criminal proceeding. And so the, the issue was, could the evidence of the marijuana be used in the juvenile proceeding against TLO? If the initial search for cigarettes by Choplick was unconstitutional, then all other evidence he found after that search is not admissible as evidence. Right, which started with rolling papers. Now, once he sees the cigarettes, then the rolling papers became, were, were in what's known as plain view. That's a term of art for Fourth Amendment purposes. In other words, they were no longer private. Plain view is one of the exceptions to the exclusionary rule. If you can see evidence of a crime, if it's out in public, you can use it in court. But it only was in plain view in the first place because Choplick opened the purse. So TLO argued that the pot and the rolling papers and the money and even her confession at the police station can't be used in court because it is fruit from a poisonous tree. Also, you said smoking was allowed in school, right? It was, in designated areas. So her having cigarettes in her purse wasn't even breaking a school rule. It wasn't. And Choplick said he only searched the purse because even though she was caught smoking, TLO lied and said she didn't even smoke at all. Civics 101 is supported by Indeed. You need to hire great people if you want to take your entire business to the next level. With the stakes this high, there's only one choice. Indeed. Indeed Indeed.com is the hiring site that helps you find quality candidates with Indeed Instant Match. Indeed searches through the millions of resumes in their database to help show you great candidates instantly. Unlike some hiring sites, there are no long-term contracts. Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility. Want your quality shortlist fast? You need Indeed. Right now, our listeners get a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash civics. This is Indeed's best offer available anywhere. Get a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash civics. Indeed.com slash civics. Offer valid through March 31st. Terms and conditions apply. So Sarah said that it came to the court as an exclusionary rule case, but it changed into something else. What did it become about? The court doesn't even address the exclusionary rule in their decision, but instead it becomes a broad Fourth Amendment case. On a base level, are your protections against unlawful search and seizure different if you're a student in a public school setting? Okay, how did the court rule? Had TLO's Fourth Amendment rights been violated? So in New Jersey v. TLO, the court rules in favor of New Jersey. Uh, I believe it was a 6-3 to three decision. Uh, said, no, there's no violation of the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. But Chopley's actions were reasonable within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment because while students have some Fourth Amendment rights, they don't have the same rights that you and I have. In other words, they have diminished protections in schools. The court held a few things. One, it held that the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply in the school context. And two, that the probable cause standard also doesn't apply in the school context. What it held was that a school official can conduct a search if at the time of the search the official has reasonable suspicion The ruling states that a teacher only needs reasonable suspicion to search a student, not probable cause. So I'm going to need both of those terms defined. 
That's a fair question. Uh, the problem with any answer you get is that the Supreme Court itself has never defined what probable cause means, and there's a reason for that. Uh, but the best answer for your audience is that probable cause means a substantial chance that the government, the police, the FBI, there's a substantial chance, a fair probability that you'll find evidence of a crime. And this ruling stands today. You do have an expectation of privacy in school, but teachers and school officials only need reasonable suspicion to search you, not probable cause. Now, reasonable suspicion is if you have a reasonable grounds for suspecting that your search will find evidence that a student violated a specific school rule, then that search is allowed. Come back to the same thing I always come to when we talk about Supreme Court cases. I always want to know what were the reverberations? How does it affect student privacy protections today? What's important to note about this case, starting in the mid-1980s, the Supreme Court is starting to chip away at the Fourth Amendment by creating these exceptions to the exclusionary rule. The year before this case was decided, the Supreme Court, for the first time, created an exception to the exclusionary rule. It's called the Leon Good Faith Exception to the Exclusionary Rule, where if a police officer in good faith relies on an arrest warrant, but that arrest warrant turns out to be faulty, then the exclusionary rule will not apply. So this case comes up the next year asking, does the exclusionary rule apply in the school context or can there be an exception? Um, and the court, of course, held holds that there's actually another exception to the warrant requirement that is in the school context. The second thing I want to make uh, point out is this is the 1980s. We're in the middle of the war on drugs. Nancy Reagan is... Um, uh, encouraging students to just say no. Say no to drugs and say yes to life. And drugs in schools becomes a huge concern. And so the court is addressing that concern by, uh, with this decision by allowing school administrators and school officials to conduct searches um, in order to create drug-free schools. So after this case came down, a lot of school administrators relied on this case to start doing strip searches of students to, uh, to look for drugs. State police are investigating after staff at a Binghamton Middle School were accused of strip searching four 12-year-old girls. Governor Cuomo directed troopers to launch an investigation. That news clip is from 2019. A complaint was filed on behalf of four 12-year-old students in Binghamton, New York, who were searched physically by the school nurse after they were seen talking and laughing in the hallway by school officials who described them as being, quote, hyper and giddy. Whenever we look at Supreme Court cases that deal with students while at school, I always think of Tinker v. Des Moines or like Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer. Yeah, cases about students' First Amendment rights. The court always wrestles with how things are different when we're talking about being in a school and balancing a student's rights with maintaining a safe and undisrupted space to learn sounds tricky if there's one thing i take away from the tlo decision it's that every case afterward that dealt with reasonable suspicion and a search at school like can a teacher demand your phone or social media password if they suspect you of bullying can they search your locker if they think you have a weapon can they pat you down in the hallway it all depends on a very specific context and the 54 words that make up that fourth amendment are being reinterpreted every single day. That's it for the saga of TLO. You can listen to all of our other Right to Privacy episodes and a whole lot more on our website, civics101podcast.org. And while you're there, if you want to learn about all of the civics trivia nuggets that we cannot cram into our episodes, subscribe to our newsletter, Extra Credit. And see what the civics team is doing all the time by following us on Facebook or Twitter. Just come and say hi, for heaven's sake, at Civics101Pod. Today's episode was produced by me, Nick Capodice, with you, Hannah McCarthy. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, you're welcome, Nick. Our staff includes Jackie Fulton. Erica Janik knows that vaping ain't allowed in the corn maze. Music in this episode by Jazar, Blue Dot Sessions, Wildlight, Matt Oakley, Lobo Loco, The Grand Affair, and the musical toast of Corpus Christi, Chris Zabriskie. Civics 101 is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and is a production of NHPR, New Hampshire Public Radio. 